Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Hanberg, forensic pathologist and medical examiner, and this is Becoming a Medical Examiner. The idea of this podcast is that a lot of people don't know what we do and what our job is. And so for the first episode, I interviewed myself and just explained what we do, how I got here, and just what it was like becoming a medical examiner. And on this episode, I have Dr. Samantha Champion. So, Sam? Hey, Eric. How's it going? Hey, it's going really good. It's really nice. Thanks so much for being on the podcast. Oh, it's my pleasure. So I, uh, I wanted to start by just addressing that you and I have one really major difference in our credentials, which is that you're not just a forensic pathologist. You are also a neuropathologist, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, I did a, foren- a forensic pathology fellowship with you in Miami. Um, and then before that, I did two years of neuropathology at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. Awesome. Well, we'll get into that in a second, but I want to start by, I think that, I don't know if this is true for you, but the most common question that I get about this job is, what is it? What what am I actually doing? So do you get that question a lot? And if so, how do you explain what we do? Yeah. So it's funny. So when, for example, my parents tell someone else, oh yeah, she's a pathologist. They're like, oh yeah, she does speech pathology. That's really important. (laughs) Um, And so not everyone fully understands what a pathologist does, let alone a forensic pathologist. Um, So yeah, a forensic pathologist um, is a physician who examines a person after they die to evaluate the cause and manner of death normally in a non-natural death, but we do see, as you know, many natural deaths. Uh, So basically, we're like their last doctors. We're the the last doctors to see that patient, and we kind of speak for them in a way, which I love. Yeah, I like that. And, I, you know, I'm always hesitant to talk about, you know, when I'm trying to explain what we do, I'm hesitant to bring up cause and manner of death because I think that that's At least, you know, when I'm talking to my Uber driver or my, you know, great aunt or something, they, that feels like too much. I just tell them we do autopsies basically, Yeah. Um, but obviously that's an incomplete explanation and yours is really nice. So part of the premise of the podcast is that we also get a lot of questions about, you know, how do I get to do what you do? The people, once, once people find out, you know, what this job is, a lot of people really like it and it sounds interesting to them, but they have no idea how to get here. So I, I said, um, and I say all the time, the simplest way to look at it is you do high school, college, medical school, residency, fellowship, and then you're there. But it sounds really easy when you say it like that. And I, I know it's more complicated. So would you mind telling me, uh, let's start at how was, uh, how was high school for you? Were you, a you know, one of the excelling through high school starting then? So I went to a Catholic high school, um, and it was uh, it, it was good. Uh, I it was a lot of rules, as you can imagine. We all wore uniforms. Yeah, that's sort of like I the think, typical. The thing I picture about Catholic school is there's a lot of rules, rules and uniforms. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it, it was it was fine. Um, I I basically talked to my studies, and I did like cross country and track. Um, I wasn't am kind of boring um and so i uh i i did well but i i would never say that i am um i'm inertly gifted at things i just work really hard like i'm like my husband who also went to the same grade school or junior high and high school as me who just gets things in a second and only have to work like a quarter of the time that I do, which is great for him and made me super jealous. <laughs> I have to, I just work hard and then eventually I get it. So, um, it Wait, is, so you're telling me that your husband went to the same, you guys went to elementary, middle and high school together as well. Uh, we, I met him in sixth grade, so it technically was junior high. So junior high, high school and college, we went together. But did so, you go to the uh, same elementary school and you just didn't meet each other? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. I, I just, I uh, messed up there. Yeah. It oh, okay. was uh, just junior high. Yeah. Got yeah. it. Wow. That's, I um, had no idea. That's incredible. Oh yeah. There you go, Eric. Um, so yeah, you also know Matthew and so we met in sixth grade, but cool. um, yeah, he and I were very, 
well, I was competitive with him. He was just like, eh, whatever. <laughs> and so, but it, uh, we were both, we both did well in school, but I have had and have to work hard and in order to get a concept or uh, get to a certain point. Fair. I mean, yeah. Hey, me too. And so yeah. after, after high school, so you, obviously you've, it sounds like you graduated from your, your Catholic high school and then you, yep. did you go straight into college or did you do anything else? Yeah, I went straight into college. I went to, uh, so I'm from Indiana. Um, and so I went to Purdue university and I studied, um, neurobiology and physiology and then I minored in Spanish there. Okay. So you did neurobiology right from the get go. Did you know that you had an interest in sort of neuroscience stuff back then? Or you just picked um, it? So, or? Yeah. So I knew I wanted to go into medicine in high school. And then I went uh, into just biology into college. And I just found out that I really loved anatomy. And then I also liked the brain too. Uh, in one of like the introductory courses to anatomy. And so I said, oh, there's this major called neurobiology uh, and physiology. And so I'm like, no, yeah, I'll, I'll just see if I like that. And then I loved it. And so from there, um, just the brain and I were really good friends. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. That's yeah. honestly, this sounds really interesting to me because you started with, so your story is that you were in high school and you had, you know, some sports that you were doing and you had, you had met who would eventually become your husband already pr before high school and you yeah. were a hard worker and then you went into college and you decided you wanted to go into medicine before then. And you sort of immediately recognized your interest in the brain. And it sounds like you have a story of pretty significant persistence, if anything. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'd say that I, it, it's interesting because I, I realized what I like to do early and it was funny because going from um, skipping ahead because we, we haven't even talked about school but um, going from med school into residency and when I was interviewing in pathology um, my one of my current mentors and role models asked me how do you know you already want to go into forensic pathology and I'm like I don't know I just know and they're like we can't change your mind I'm like you can try <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but we'll get there. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I end up like stumbling upon things that I like and I try out other things, but then I end up just saying, well, yeah, I was right the first time. Let's just keep going with what I'm doing and work hard. And that's how I got where I am. But I honestly, mean, I think that sounds great. Ahead. That's like the opposite of my story, right? <laughs> I told you, I, I kind of did 25 different things and, you know, certainly part of me is envious of the the idea that you could have just been so certain of all of that right at the get go. And it lets you, yeah. I mean, not lets you, it's not like it's easy to be that dedicated, but man, that's, it's so cool to have this one persistent goal and you just keep tacking on new goals that you keep sticking with. That's awesome. <laughs> that's something yeah. that I don't think my ADHD would allow me to do. Well, and it's, it's, it's interesting because I, I get other people saying, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? So I get people, uh, from the outside saying, Sam, are you sure you want to do this? And I'm like, I, I am considering other, these other options, but so far I've been, I guess, pretty persistent. I like that word. So, yeah. <laughs> so from, from college, so you did neurobiology yeah. and you minored in Spanish. And I know that because you, uh, I had to ask you for help with Spanish so much in Miami and, oh boy, yeah. I really should have learned Spanish. And now that I am past Miami and now I'm in Texas, I still haven't learned Spanish. <laughs> I really, really, really should. I know I should, uh, oh, but beautiful. I appreciate the help with Spanish. And so you finished college and then did you, and you went straight into medical school from there? Yeah, I went straight into medical school. Um, so yeah, I went to, uh, not Illinois, sorry. I live in Illinois. Um, I, I went to Indiana uh, University School of Medicine in Notre Dame and I actually stayed with my parents because I'm like, I'm going to save money. Uh, um, so it sounds like you maybe don't recommend doing that. No, I did. I do. I, I love my parents uh, and they were super supportive of me and um, I basically studied all the time and they, uh, they basically would make my meals when I would get home super late. And so, uh, no, they, they, they were super supportive. Um, if you have a family environment like that and with people who are just like, 
say, okay, go ahead and do your thing and we'll take care of you in the background, that's great. Because yeah. medical school, as you know, it can be uh, very trying. It's long hours. You are basically studying all the time and oftentimes you really don't have much of a social life. So yeah. um, it's really good to have that support system just to say, okay, we got you. We understand the way you're going through is hard, but at the end, it's all worth it. Well, I mean, that's, I, I am a little bit envious too of, of the idea of having someone who can support me by there, especially in medical school, my diet got out of control and, uh, you know, there were a lot of nights after surgery rotation or something where I would have a bowl of cereal would be my dinner. But I very specifically remember one time having uh, my dinner was a piece of toast that I put um, cupcake frosting on. And yep. the next day, my my roommate, best friend, Daryl, sent me a, a meme from the TV show Rugrats, where Stu yeah. Pickles was making pudding at two in the morning. And yep. his wife said, why are you doing that? And he said, because my life is out of control. And I was like, that is a yes. perfect meme. That's what med school felt like to me. So having someone who could have made the pudding for me would have been wonderful. <laughs> but No, um, it was great. So, uh, no, I think I distinctly remember in my emergency medicine rotation, one of the attendings just getting out a can of soup, not even heating it up and just eating it straight <laughs> out of the can. And I'm like, OK, here we are. <laughs> yeah, I told you that I had a uh, actually a neuropathology attending during my residency that he would use the, the lamp on his microscope to heat up beans. Oh, God. I still yeah. I still think that that man was hilarious anyway. Um, so tell me. So it sounds like where was your so how far away was your high school and your college and your medical school? That was all in Indiana, right? Yeah. So I grew up in South Bend, Indiana, the Notre Dame country. Uh, my high school was maybe 20 minute drive. My uh, Purdue University is uh, in West Lafayette. So that's two and a half hours away. Um, south and um, sorry, southwest, and then my uh, medical school was right back in South Bend, Indiana. I was on Notre Dame campus, so again, it was about 20 minutes away from my house and maybe like five minutes away from my high school. So I was in Indiana for a long time before residency. Well, how was so my I, I said in my where I interviewed myself, I said that I found the most difficult part of the entire process to be the pre-med process because that was just, there was no transparency and it was so frustrating and it felt like I had to make sure everything went absolutely correct, went, that it all yeah. went good for yeah. things to work out. Whereas after you get into med school, it's sort of, as long as you can avoid things going bad, it will work out. Yeah. Was that was that the hardest part for you as well? Yeah, so I... I totally agree because uh, in our and on the road to becoming a doctor, once you be once you're in medical school, as long as you pass your courses, you're gonna be a doctor. Like you don't even have to be the top of the class. As long as you pass, it's you're gonna have an MD or a BO at the end of your name, um, and which is great when you're in medical school and you're going to residency. It. It, they basically hold your hand and say, you're going to get a job. It, you may have some stumbling blocks along the way, but it's completely different from people who are out, um, not the real world, but in a different field where they have to go and find a job on their own. And it's basically uncharted territories. Whereas here, there is a system where you just follow the rules and then you'll get to where you're going. But beforehand, pre-med you're kind of stumbling around trying to say okay i need to check this box i need to check this box but no one told me i need to check this box it's a good yes. thing I'm, i like stumbled upon it now oh it's so um, frustrating and then of course the med school interviews um were very um were very stressful and you don't know what they would ask and so i totally agree with you yeah it's a good thing you brought that up too so let me ask, what do you think in your, so now you are a sub, a multiple subspecialist doctor. What do you think the relevance of the MCAT is to your life right now? <laughs> it's so far away. <laughs> um, just, just pass it. Uh, yeah. Just pass it. I mean, like, learn what you need to know for the MCAT. And it really, I mean, it, it's good to know for like, 
found basic foundation. But honestly, it I don't use it that often. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely <laughs> don't. I was uh, yeah. I was watching the first episode of The X Files two days ago, which I do mm-hmm. intermittently. I love that show, and uh, in the first episode, at one point, I don't know if you've ever watched. I'll, I'll save you from my X Files uh, talk, but. <laughs> At one point, Mulder puts up a uh, old timey slideshow where you press the button and it projects it onto the wall. He put up an old timey yeah. slide of just a molecular structure and showed oh, Scully, God. who is the show's more or less, she's a medical examiner. And within two seconds, she goes, Well, it's organic. And then she yeah. goes, As Some sort of synthetic protein, maybe. And I thought, There is no way I could possibly do that. I, if I spent some time and I was offered the option of organic versus inorganic, I'd probably be able to get that far, but just that isn't, that is not part of my daily life anymore. And I remember during the MCAT thinking, oh, being a doctor is going to be brutal if I just have to constantly do these (laughs) OCHEM reductions and reactions and all that stuff. So, I mean, yeah, but the thing that I, for us, like trajectory of projectiles and turning, like it reminds me of Orgo, organic chemistry, like turning this, uh, this molecule in your head around um it it was kind of like 3d that you're trying to figure out the structure of it and that's what i do kind of for like projectiles like how did this projectile enter the body how could the decision have been when it was passing through the body that kind of stuff that's what reminds me of that but basically other than like in medical not medical school in um uh in at purdue Anatomy, I use all the time. Yeah, that's fair. Um, but the, the physiology, I use, yeah, but mm, nah. <laughs> just pass the test. <laughs> so what, what was medical school like for you? So you knew, did you know during medical school that you wanted to do pathology? Oh, so that, I had an idea. So in, in um, beginning of, college at Purdue, I just make some extra money and get some exposure to medicine because I was like, I'm going to be a doctor, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, So I was a phlebotomist. Um, Those are the people where they go and wake you up and got out, got awful hours in the hospital and don't let you sleep and take your blood. Um, (laughs) Okay. Yeah, that's true. Exactly. So uh, I learned that skill of how to, uh, how to get people blood. Um, and then I also learned how basically the hospital works at all hours of the day and night and also how pathology lab works. And I'm like, Oh, that's pretty cool. And I remember there was one time when I was working as a phlebotomist, I think it was, uh, during the morning and actually one of my family friends, um, or friends of the family is Dr. Gaganes, uh, who's a pathologist, in um, South Bend, he's now retired. Uh, he walked in, and they're like, "The pathologist is here. The pathologist is here." And I'm like, "Oh my gosh, this guy must be super important." And I thought it was him, and I'm like, "Oh, it's Dr. Kevin. I know him." And they were all in awe <laughs> that I knew this guy. Um, and I'm like, "Oh, let's. I should look into pathology since I work into I, I work um, in the pathology lab." And so I had that idea going into med school and so again like yeah yeah and so like the first year of med school as you know we have anatomy um and then we have uh neuroscience and again i did really well in neuroscience i i love the brain um and i also like anatomy um and i'm like okay well maybe something uh to do with anatomy or neuroscience i was thinking of neurology um, but then second year with the pathology experience at the back of my head, um, we had a pathology course taught by a forensic pathologist, uh, which was great because in med school, we don't get a lot of uh, experience with forensic pathology if you don't have something taught by a forensic pathologist. Yeah, that's um, definitely true. That's I, true. I think across the board, there's very little exposure. Yeah. So um, we had that class and it was basically how to make diagnoses for all different organ systems. And I loved it. I was like, oh my gosh, I can make this diagnosis. I can save this patient's life and we can solve these problems. And then they, he did the subsection of forensic pathology. And I'm like, oh, it's just like surgery without all the pressure. 
and um, he required us to see an autopsy for the first time in order to pass that section of the course. I just thought it was so uh, such a cool combination of anatomy, working with your hands, and then making a diagnosis. So when you saw so that, that first point, autopsy, like, were you were yeah. you like hands on? Did you have gloves on and PPE, and you actually participate, or was this you know standing far back behind the counter and and watching someone else do it, or what was it? Unfortunately, it was the second. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, it was, uh, Dr. Crowlow, uh, Joseph Crowlow, who worked in Michigan, taught the course at that time. And it was him and a resident that were doing the autopsy together. Um, so, but ever since then I was hooked. Interesting. Okay. So what did it, did it go sort of how you expected it to go? Cause I don't know what, if you had any image in your mind of what an autopsy would be like, but I, at least now, I think especially now because of TV and movies, people have a sort of vague idea of what happens in an autopsy. But I have learned since doing this job that the idea people form is often quite wrong. So did it, yeah. did you have an idea of what it should be or were you surprised? How, how did you feel about it? Um, I went in not knowing anything and being kind of nervous because like when we, we put on like our PPE and we, I basically look like a Michelin man. I'm like, oh, my God, what's going <laughs> on? Um, but I go in and I see that they do the piece method. He was doing the piece method. Basically, you're dissecting the organs, organ by organ instead of on block. Um, and I was just like, oh, my gosh, that's what a liver looks like. That's what a, a lung looks like. Just in real life, because, of course, you see the photos. And then how he was dissecting them, basically bread loafing them like food or like a bread loaf. I just thought it was so weird, but then so cool. And I was afraid that maybe I would get squeamish or something, but no, I, I didn't. And I, I guess I have to thank my dad for that because he exposed me to a lot of horror movies and stuff as a kid and uh, like... Uh, I skinned uh, or, or I uh, would clean fish and whatever. So I, I guess it, I wasn't inherently grossed out by a lot of things at that point. <laughs> Interesting. But, so uh, as, a, as a little kid yeah. while in Catholic school, so you'd spend all day in yeah. Catholic school, you know, following the rules, then you'd go home and clean fish and watch horror movies that prepared yeah. you for autopsy. Yeah. yeah okay. Basically. Fair enough. <laughs> So, so um, you yeah, started, you had this interesting experience where I've never heard a story about the pathologist as a rock star when they walk in and everyone's like, Ooh, that's the pathologist. That's not the classic way that pathologists are portrayed, but I really like that. I wish that yeah. that was true more often. So you had that guy oh, and then you had yeah. this viewing of an autopsy as well as a course taught by a forensic pathologist. So was that is that when you knew you were going into pathology or did you still have some flip-flopping? It sounds like you don't do a lot of flip-flopping. I don't do a lot of flip-flopping. I, 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 yeah, I guess as I'm talking to you, I guess I'm realizing that. Um, but I mean, I, in med school, I was also thinking uh, when we did our clinical years, I think it was like 34th fourth year, no third year. Um, I did neurology. Um, and again, I just, I love making the diagnosis. It's finding the lesion. And I just feel like house or something like that. And I'm like, ha ha, I made this really hard diagnosis. Um, and I love how the brain works. I love the circuits. I love the anatomy. And um, when I find the lesion, I think that's really, really cool. But what's really hard about practicing neurology is a lot of times, especially with patients with neurodegenerative diseases, you're managing your patients, but then there's uh, not a lot you can do because the the course of their disease just worsens. Yeah. Um, and it's really, really sad to see. Um, my mom wanted me to go into Hemonc too, because she's like, you'll, you'll, you would be such a good uh, oncologist. You're good with people. And I'm like, thanks, mommy. I don't know if I'm good, <laughs> that good with people. But uh, it's, again... It's, uh, making the diagnosis, but then following patients that may or that you may or may not lose after you have that connection. And I I give so much respect to clinicians that do that. It's such a need to specialty, but for me, it would break my heart. Um, yeah, so it's interesting for, you say that. That's yeah. what I always say is that, you know, people always say that our field is so sad. And I agree. It is sad. 
But I think that yeah. pretty much all fields in medicine are very sad. And I yeah. say, you know, for everyone that said, you know, all my pathology co-residents that said they couldn't do what I do because it's so sad. I say that's only because you forget that you just diagnosed 10 new cancers in living people who still have to go through that whole process. And for exactly. me, our patients are their suffering is over and we're providing answers for the people who are still there. And so pretty much all we do is alleviate suffering. We never bring on more or at least very rarely. And so I find our field to be kind of on the least sad end of what medicine is. But I guess that just depends on how you look at it. No, I totally agree with you because people ask me, how do you do what you do? You're, you're dealing with death all the time. But I, I feel exactly the same way where you're giving a, assurances to family members. We're helping to alleviate their pain and helping them to understand death and how their loved one passed away. Uh, and basically giving them a little bit of closure, whereas uh, the, uh, these other specialties, the ones that I referred to, um, your deal, your, you, you have a relationship with a patient, and if it goes wrong, it can be, for me, heartbreaking to see your patient and friend pass away. Of course, it's great if, when you save their life and then when you uh, cure them of the disease, but for me, it's mostly positive because I'm helping the family understand why their loved one passed away and also helping other family members, especially if you find a genetic cause to a disease and preventing um, another family member from succumbing to the same thing. So I think it's very important what we do. I like how you say that. That was great. Oh, thanks. Well, you know, I'm biased, but I, uh, <laughs> I agree with everything you said too. I, I think that this is a, a great field and, it's not as sad as people think. And uh, yeah, I think it's good. But I do want to talk about you had a few big changes happen when you went into residency and you did a few things that are kind of um, not typical and certainly not typical for you. One of which is you moved kind of far away. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what was that yeah, like? Because you did a lot at home. I mean, you you went through you were you were sort of right near your home all the way up until residency. And then you picked up and moved. Yeah, no, that it was, I wanted to leave though. Um, I really did. So I, I'm not originally from Indiana. Um, throughout my life, I lived in like Ohio and North Carolina. Um, and, but at, most of my life I lived in Indiana and I was kind of done. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, I'm ready to get out. I'm ready to get out. Um, and so I met in Boston and I'd never been to the East coast. I, um, well, I, I visited with my family, but I, again, never lived alone without my support system. Um, and so I went to Boston, fell in love with it. The first six months of uh, residency, um, I was there alone without my husband because um, Matthew and I got married uh, right after med school. And uh, he was finishing up law school. And so the first six months we were uh complete we lived separately and it was my first time living alone in my own apartment and doing my own thing and so I it was so much fun um it was different because I didn't have my support system there but I was like "Ooh, this is what independence uh is like other than like college but college is really not you're not really adulting in college I guess <laughs> well, um, I'm sure lots of college students would disagree, but I absolutely understand what you mean. It is definitely yeah, different yeah. when you have uh, much more significant responsibilities or at least, yeah. you know, my college was, I, I didn't have as much responsibility and I was not as responsible as I could have been. Well, yeah. I mean, and I, other college students have different uh, experiences, but in college for me, I, I was basically, I was, following the mold and I was studying but then all my meals were cared for by residence halls and um I just went to class and I went back to my dorm and I just studied and so I'm just like I didn't have to take care of myself as an adult <laughs> and so uh at that point when I moved to Boston I was alone and I was responsible for my own meals and I had to uh figure out how to juggle work and life and then also being a newlywed too um so it, it for me that's when like the adulting happens yeah. um yeah and then of course like as you know residency is it's residency you you go in expecting to work hard and you do 
Um, and so it was a lot, a lot of long days, a lot of long days, which also helped being away from Matthew because I, I was just so busy working and learning that it was, a, it, I didn't really have time to think about being away from him. So. Speak, so I do know, so you went to one of the Harvard hospitals. I know that. And I, yeah. I also know that you did a, a somewhat unique path. Um, and I talked about on, on my interview that, uh, I did anatomic pathology only, which is a three year track. And I did that because that's what I needed to go into forensic pathology. And I had sort of already done some other stuff and I just wanted to get it over with. I didn't need clinical pathology. Whereas most residents will do anatomic and clinical pathology in four years, but you actually didn't do either of those things, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, So like what I was referring to in my uh, earlier on, um, Dr. Frash was one of uh, the people that interviewed me when I went to MDH or before I went to MDH. And he was like, uh, are you sure you want to go into forensic pathology? So he was actually interviewing me for um, anatomical and neuropathology. Uh, I did the four-year anatomical and neuropathology track, which is two years of AP um, and two years of NP instead of the two years of AP and two years of CP. Because I knew that I didn't want to do CP. I knew that. And I loved the brain. And I found out that actually in between medical school and then also uh, researching different pathology tracks that I could do instead of uh, neurology, I could do neuropathology, which is again, making diagnosis for, for things in the central and peripheral nervous system. And I could also do autopsies and be kind of my own expert in the brain and when I eventually went up to uh, and became a forensic pathologist I wouldn't have to do my own uh, I wouldn't have to do a neuropathology consult I could actually evaluate the brain uh, and other nervous system I'm stumbling over this lyric sorry (laughs) no that's fine I I, so you 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 wanted to be able to be the neuropathologist that other people ask and then you could sort of make a consult of yourself Exactly. Yeah. So I, I uh, could I could basically be my own consul. Exactly. Uh, that's yeah. really interesting because I think that, you know, for as little as medical students really hear or, or learn about pathology in general, I think they certainly don't learn about the different subspecialties and ways that you can pursue being a pathologist. And part of that comes yeah. from that the way pathology is taught in the United States is very different than it's taught elsewhere And here in the United States, the most common pathway is AP and CP, which is anatomic and clinical pathology, anatomic pathology, AP, clinical pathology, CP. And the way I describe those two things is anatomic pathology is sort of broken down into mostly surgical pathology, which is interpretation of biopsies and the stuff surgeons cut out of you and autopsy. That's more or less what anatomic pathology consists of. Clinical pathology is when they draw blood. And they try to figure out what's going on in the blood using sort of very expensive, fancy machines. There's a lot more to both of those. I acknowledge that. But if I'm explaining it to a medical student, that's how I do it. But I had no idea that there was an option to do anatomic, uh, anatomic pathology and neuropathology as your four year curriculum before I was actually involved in the residency. And um, I just think that that's so cool because you basically do the same AP curriculum, the the, you know, surgical pathology of biopsies and resections plus autopsy, but you just condense that into two years. And then your next two years is made up essentially primarily or entirely of neuropathology, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. So I did uh, my first two years of neuropath and I learned, uh, sorry, of uh, anatomical path and I condensed basically, uh, I, I condensed all of that um, training into those first two years and uh, I had to learn as much as I could for my anatomical boards then. And then I did my neuropathology training for two years and just dedicated learning about all of the pathologies of the brain uh, and spinal cord and peripheral nerves and musculature then. Yeah, I mean, honestly, um, I think that sounds awesome. I really wanted to do the same thing. It just wasn't an option where I was, but it's a super cool field. And I know that I used you as a consult many times. Yeah, no, it, it, I love it. I absolutely love it. And I love being able to evaluate uh, 
my own brains and also do those consults as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm happy that I'm as a forensic pathologist and still using those skills right now. It's a, it's an option if you want to go into forensic pathology, but also want to do neuropathology, you can do that. You could also go into uh, academics and be a neuropathologist, but also work in autopsy as well. Yeah. Um, so so there, there are different ways to go about it. So uh, I, I guess expanding on the fact that I was able to use you for consults gets us into that the way I even really got to know you was that you and I both went to fellowship together in Miami and um, we had the offices right across from each other. And that's one of my favorite memories of the whole place was every day when we'd go pester each other or more. It was me pestering you, I suppose. I, I do want to talk a little bit about Miami because my life has been made up of moving across the country and doing all kinds of craziness. And for you, you're, you know, you're coming off the tail of having just had a, a what I presume was a very difficult and trying period of living away from home a few states away and, you know, sort of in a similar climate, um, at least in terms of weather. And, yep. you know, you got to have that experience. But rather than moving straight home, you ended up moving down to Miami, which I would say is about as far away from Indiana in spirit as you could get. Yeah, no, I mean, I I, I wanted to go to the best program for my training. Um, so I was lucky enough to map into MDH um, and uh, learn from the best, in my opinion, uh, neuropathologists uh, that I could learn from, as well as anatomical pathologists. And then when I was research- researching forensic pathology programs, um, Miami was among the best programs in the nation, in my opinion. And so um, I interviewed at several different places. And when I uh, was offered the position at Miami, um, I was ecstatic to accept it because of the different experiences that we had. Um, And then also I was, even though I lived in Indiana for a very long time, I wanted to explore other areas of the country and different cultures um, because I think that's super important to understanding just how people, how different people function um, and where, uh, and just understanding different cultures, because I think that's important for our our line of work as well, too. So we'll Um, definitely talk about Miami as a fellowship, but what did you think of Miami as a city? um, Miami as a city. So my mom's from Puerto Rico. So I was familiar with, uh, different Hispanic cultures because in Indiana, there's not many people that speak Spanish. Uh, I mean, relatively to other places in the country or the world. And so um, a lot of our family friends were Hispanic from Colombia, uh, Mexico. And um, my mom, is, of course, is from Puerto Rico. So I was familiar with the Hispanic culture. So I was totally fine with the, uh, with people speaking Spanish to me and how they acted around me. Um, what was different to me was uh, the weather, uh, especially yeah. being so humid, and then also the traffic. That traffic was insane. Um, yeah, I the was drivers commuting. in Miami are unique. Yeah. Yes, they are unique. Um, But I learned a lot, especially uh, for motor vehicle accidents, which we saw a lot of. Um, And then also I learned to drive in Indiana, so I uh, didn't have to deal with a lot of... uh, a lot of people who drove aggressively. And so that was a very good experience for me to be a more defensive driver. (laughs) (laughs) It's admirable that you turn everything into a learning experience, Sam. So (laughs) tell me about what, you know, I I talked a little bit about the sort of general structure of fellowship. And and since we went to the same fellowship, I know that yours was more or less the same. How, what was your experience? I think for me, I broke it down into, you know, we had didactics and we had, autopsy, which was sort of hands-on training, and then we had scenes. How do you feel like all that went for you? It went well. Um, So part of the reason why I chose Miami over other programs is that it offers um, the chance uh, for you to follow the case from the very beginning to the end. What I mean about that is um, we were on call as fellows um, at least once a week and then um, once every month where we would go, if there was a homicide at all hours of the night, 
you would go to that scene and you would work up that scene and see the decedent in the place where they passed and take pictures, interview the police, um, and basically get an idea of what happened uh, to the decedent even before they make it to the office. Um, and then you make decisions on what you want x-rayed just to see if there's anything inside the body that you want to see, like a projectile or maybe a piece of a sharp force instrument or anything like that, um, or any factors. Um, and then the next day, even if you were at a scene at 3 a.m., which did happen, um, you would start and do the autopsy in the morning, um, and that would be your case. And then you, uh, you figure out uh, what injuries were on the body, and then um, after you were done, and then after you also did other cases, because that's not your only case, you would uh, write up the case after discussing it with your supervising uh, doctor, and then um, make sure everything was correct, and plus or minus wait for test results, and then um, finalize the case eventually, and then you would talk to the family about it and tell them um, how their loved one would uh, pass away and what happened. Yeah, so, I mean, that is and, definitely yeah. beginning to end. Yeah, no, and that's what I loved about it because it, it, it Miami offered the, you the opportunity to be the doctor and be there again for your patient from beginning to end and being able to tell their story. So that's why I chose Miami. Um, it was a little different for me because I actually was very pregnant at, uh, during the beginning of our post. <laughs> so I had to also figure out how to handle being, I think I was like seven, I was six months pregnant when we started um, and actually having a baby and then also going to scenes and cutting also while being very pregnant. So that was also different. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Cause I think that's something that, sure. that, you know, they're not legally allowed to talk about in general in, uh, in interviews and in the workplace, but I know that it's something that's important to people. And so how was it? I mean, you, you effectively described a very busy life as a fellow um, where yeah. you go from beginning to end and you have more than one case and you have ongoing cases. And in addition to that, you were pregnant. And then after you were pregnant, you were a new mom. What was that yeah. like? It was, it was hard. Honestly, it was, it was, but it's doable. Um, I think I was the First, I wasn't the first fellow to have a baby because I had um, other men who had babies during the fellowship, but I was the first woman to have uh, actually give birth and have the um, experience of becoming a new mom. Um, so it was new for, for all sides of uh, the fellowship. And so I, I, I was doing, I was starting uncharted waters there. Um, but I knew I could do it and it can be done for any budding forensic women pathologists out there. You can do it. Um, it, so I remember going to a scene, I think I was eight months pregnant, um, with one of our ph photographers at the beginning of September, very, very hot in Miami. Um, and I went to that Scene of a person who was found in an attic, and it was like a crawl space attic. And when we we're at scenes, we need to go up into the space and take photos just to see what was going on and what's surrounding the decedent. Could they have injured themselves on wire? Did they um, hurt themselves uh, in a different way? Um, and so I remember, and I didn't tell my husband this because he would have freaked out at that time. Um, I remember actually climbing up on a ladder into a, an attic crawl space, and I couldn't fit all the way through um, the hole. And uh, very, very hot. Everything was shut off, uh, air conditioning wise. And uh, I remember telling a, a photographer that accompanied me, saying, "I can't fit up here, <laughs> but I can see what's going on." And I was like, I was telling the police officers exactly what I could see in the crawl space and then I had the photographer go up there and say take pictures for me because I can't fit <laughs> um, 
And then the next day I did the autopsy. Um, so it's just little things I don't think about, like how big your belly gets and you can't actually physically go into some spaces. Um, but you still try to get the do- job done as best you can. And then um, once I had my daughter, uh, I came back after four weeks and I tried to just get back on the horse again. But again, it, it was it was hard because you still have to go on the scene that, uh, in the middle of the night. But then you have a baby who wants to be breastfed. Um, so you just try your best. And then, I mean... And you guys were super supportive of me, too, if um, I needed to go to a doctor's appointment or something like that. Um, One of our fellows uh, would uh, actually offer to cover for one of my days. Um, But, yeah. I mean, I I think that's important, right? That's something that both you and I said is that having a support system in medical school and in residency and in fellowship is really important. And that's what I tell everyone when they're saying I need to look for the best residency I can go to, I say, go to the one where you feel like you will feel comfortable with the people around you and that you like the people around you because you're going to spend an awful lot of time with them and you're going to grow to depend on them a lot. And so I'm glad that, you know, you felt that way in Miami. We certainly felt that way too. And you talked about, so well, actually first, do you, looking back, do you feel like there would have been a better time or an easier time to have been pregnant and had a baby? Do you feel like doing that in in medical school or residency would have been better or easier for you? Or even now as an, as an attending and practicing, do you feel like any of that would have made a, a significant difference and you would have done it differently if you, you know, if you had that ability to make that kind of choice? So I, I, people always tell me there's never a good time to have a kid. And there isn't, there isn't. It, it happens, you make it work. Um, if I look back, maybe it would have been better timing if I did it my second year of neural path um, because it was lighter. I, for the second year of neural path, and at least at MGH, it was mostly um, I was in charge of the ADRC, the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, um, and left for the surgical pathology service, which is very, the volume is high which is what we I would cover as the first-year neuropathology fellow. Um, so I had a little more time to do research, to um, do autopsies, because uh, the people uh, at my neuropathology fellowship were very, very supportive of what I wanted to do as a, uh, at, and become a forensic pathologist. Uh, so I was able to do autopsies, um, and they basically let me handle most of the, neuropath uh, part, of course, with supervision of autopsies on my own, even during like COVID, um, which was great because they knew I, what I wanted to go into. But I had a little more time. So it, maybe if I decided to have my daughter then, that would have been a little bit easier. But I mean, you're going to be busy no matter what. Yeah. Just make it work. I mean, that's, <laughs> I, you know, I, I've never been pregnant, so I don't know. But I can say that it does seem like, at least from my experience through medical training, we're, we're busy all the time and there are a little bit lighter times, but they tend to be followed and, uh, and preceded by very, very busy times. So I don't know that there's ever yeah. a super easy time uh, that's prolonged, but I, yeah. you did like- talk about being, you know, it, a bit of a physical challenge while being pregnant. And I talked a little bit about that this job is physically challenging to an extent but a lot of yeah. people ask about it being emotionally and mentally challenging. Do you, what, what are the big challenges that you feel like you still find in this job? Yeah. So, yeah, physically challenging for sure because you're on your feet for hours. Um, and it, it, doing an evisceration is a workout. <laughs> so uh, sometimes when I was like, I don't, I'm so tired, I can't go home and work out. I'm like, oh, I just eviscerated a few people. It's, I, I had a workout today. Um, but emotionally, um, especially as a new mom, it was babies and it still is babies, babies and young kids. Those are hard for me um, because I mean, theoretically no one should come across our tables because we see non-natural death. However, life is life and uh, they do, but no kid should come across our table. And it just breaks my heart um, when we have to figure out uh, when we have to figure out how a kid dies. Um, 
in a non-natural way and yeah. even not in natural ways too. So it's, yeah. it's always the case. I, I definitely understand. And I, I have a feeling that's, that seems to be the one sort of aspect of the field that a lot of people struggle with. But like you said, there's, you know, life is life. And unfortunately bad things happen and sad things happen. And it doesn't mean they need answers any less. In fact, I would say that's sort of when we get to be the most helpful and provide a lot of answers to people who need it desperately. Um, yeah. But it is tough. I agree. And I talked in a, a little bit about, you know, I think, I think we even talked in fellowship about this. I think the term resilience is used very poorly in medical training to mean yeah. suck it up and deal with any type of torturous work schedule and punitive work schedule that we give you. And that's not really what resilience is. Resilience is when you can go through what we have to go through to find those answers, like in the case of a baby who dies unexpectedly and still go about the rest of your day and still deal with going home and coming back and doing it again. That's what resilience is supposed to mean. And and do you feel like you got enough of that through your training to, to make it, um, make it doable for you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, definitely. Because we saw a lot of different types of cases. And I mean, when I came home after I did a baby case, I hugged my daughter and of course my husband, but first my daughter, because (laughs) she's my baby. (laughs) But, uh, but then, I mean, you think about how you can give an answer to families and make it, somewhat more bearable. So yeah, I guess I guess. How, how do you feel like your job has affected? Do you feel like it has had an effect on your family, on your husband and your daughter, and even on your parents and friends? Do you feel like your job has affected them? Yeah, I think so. Um, my husband, Matthew, seems so supportive. Uh, he, he has followed me because he's also from Matthew, as I said, from South Bend, Indiana too. He's followed me from Boston to Miami and now to Chicago. And so uh, he has been my support system. Um, and so he has learned what it's like to uh, be married to a forensic pathologist or a resident or um, a fellow. And uh, he now knows that side of medicine that not many people know about because you see things on TV and it's not always true. Um, he also knows he would say, okay, it's doctor time. So like in residency, when I said, oh yeah, I'm going to be home in like 15 minutes, he would add an hour to that. So uh, he just learned to understand that. Uh, for Aurora, she doesn't know anything else right now. Um, she went to crime scenes with me, as I said. She did autopsies with Oh, me you meant while you utero, were pregnant. <laughs> I was like, in, I, did, I had utero, no idea you utero. brought her with. <laughs> By the way, Eric, she, I, actually she did visit the office when we were uh, making a road trip um, up to Illinois. Um, I don't know if you were there, but yes, you met all of our attending. That's funny. Um, but no, she, in, in utero, she was there. So she probably heard all these things that we were talking about. Um, and, uh, one of our texts still follows, uh, her on, um, a shared drive that I have. So they called her the Miami baby, but she doesn't know anything else. Um, so I'm looking forward to like the first time they do show and tell or like parent teacher conference. I, I don't know how that's going to go. <laughs> um, and then for my parents, they, they think what I do is really cool. And they learned about this, uh, this field of medicine, because again, not many people know about it. At first they were like, Oh, like what my mom said, you'd be a great oncologist. Are you sure you want to be a pathologist? And now she's like, what you do is so important and unappreciated. And it, it, I'm, they're proud of what I do. Um, because it's really, really important and someone needs to do it. So, well, that's really yeah. nice. I mean, it sounds like you got a, a really good support system. I also really like that your family seems to have this bias towards, uh, towards medical examiners being treated like rock stars and like we're super important. And I love that. <laughs> so let's keep that yeah. up. What, um, <laughs> what would you say overall is the most common question you get asked when you tell someone what you do for work? So, you know, you're in an oh, Uber yeah. or something. What's the most common thing people ask? Oh, um, <laughs> oh yeah. The one that I get a lot is whether they're like, Oh cool. Do you watch like, 
Miami, like, what was it? Miami Vice? Is that what Miami, it was? No, Sam, it was not Miami Vice unless they're talking about what a show it? from the 80s or something. But it probably CSI. Yeah, CSI or like uh, other of those uh, crime scene shows. And as you can probably tell, the answer, answer is, is no. I don't. <laughs> Um, I don't, I, when I get home or when I do, uh, when I do stuff to unwind, it's not medicine. So, uh, I always get, I was like, Oh, do you watch a lot of those crime scene shows? And I'm like, no, I don't. Well, don't worry. I'm making up the difference. I watch enough for, for the two of us. That's awesome. What about, what is the funniest question you've been asked? Does anything stand out in your mind as something that just made you laugh because of whatever, anything anyone um, asked you that was funny? How do you deal with the smell? Um, everybody, and, I don't know why that's so common that people know that there are such smells associated with this job, but yeah, people do ask I, that. So what do you do? I, I, <laughs> uh, some people put like Vicks in their mask and stuff. I really don't do anything. I've gotten like at first when I start, if it's a decomposing case, I smell it. Yeah. But I'm just like. I'm going to ignore it. And then I go nose blind after a while, even when I was pregnant too. I don't know. Um, like everything else bothered me. Like I couldn't open the refrigerator and not gag. Sorry, Matthew, even Matthew smelled awful to me. But, uh, just when I did like decom- decomposing cases or smelly cases, I was just like, okay, well, it's, I smell it. I'm going to ignore it. And then I go nose blind. So I don't do anything. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's something I think that that's something that we all do for, we all have this ability to sort of put on our doctor's hat and just turn off our normal experience so that we can focus on getting stuff done. And I think that's part of the way we actually get through it. And I agree with you. I, I never used to do anything about the smell because the smell genuinely doesn't bother me. Occasionally I will smell it and be like, that's, it's a lot, but I like you, I go nose blind, but I did recently start putting, um, peppermint essential oil on my mask, not because it, you know, helps me get over this horrible smell. That doesn't, I I just don't notice it so much, but when you have peppermint oil on your mask, everything smells like peppermint, which is kind of nice. So I do it just because it's kind of nice, but it's not necessary. Um, so I, I think we're, we're about at an hour. So there were a few questions that I wanted to, um, to ask. And I just want to talk about these things specifically because I know we talk about death a lot. We talk about a lot of really heavy stuff. And so I do want to talk about if you were not a medical examiner, if you were not going to be a forensic pathologist, what would you want to do both in and out of medicine? Okay. In medicine, neurology, as you could probably predict. Um, And out of medicine, I'd be an artist. Like I like, I love to draw. So maybe like a comic strip artist. Like a comic artist, like newspaper comics or like comic book comics? Uh, newspaper comics, yeah. That is awesome. Have you ever done that? No, but like in, I, I love to sketch. Um, I, I, I sketch people, I sketch things. I don't do it as much anymore. So I, have no, I have no time. But uh, during the pandemic, I did um, like chalk art. Uh, I had a huge cement wall in my patio in Boston. And I did like little caricatures and little uh, drawings with Chuck just because I could because we had a little more time during the pandemic. Yeah, that's so so, it's interesting you mentioned that. I was thinking about that recently that, you know, obviously a lot of bad stuff came from the pandemic and still does. But one of the interesting things was how many people when they had a lot of free time were drawn towards doing more creative things. I think a lot of people picked up baking. A lot of people learned to, to draw. And when we, when we finally had a moment where we just had no choice, but to be unproductive and, you know, in, in the classical sense of productivity, everyone learned to sort of embrace their creative aspects. And I think that's really cool. I would love to see your comics sometime, but I'm not going to force you. And then, uh, what, what about just to sort of remind people that we are also normal people I'm not going to make you explain it. And it also doesn't have to be funny to me, but what is something in your life that has made you laugh really hard, whether related to being a doctor or not, just some, something that made you laugh. Um, one time in Miami, 
I, I look, I, I always look in my external exam in people's anuses because they can pack drugs there. Um, and it was a decomposing case. I was one of our, I was with one of our techs uh, that likes to joke around with me. And I was looking in the anus and it, uh, there was a huge fart and gust of wind in my face. <laughs> Um, because of course, decomposing bodies has, have a lot of built up air. And so there was a huge, <laughs> and it was like visible hair moving back under all of my PPE. And then my tech and I just crack up and I'm like, I totally deserve that for sure. I, and I should have known that was coming. I love it. Um, yeah. What a very specific story that really, really could only come from you, Sam. I love it. That's yep. fantastic. Well, thank you so yep. much. I really appreciate you doing the podcast and sharing your story about what it's been like becoming a medical examiner. And okay. so is there anything else that you want to add? Anything else you want to tell anyone? Um, just for anyone, um, just do what you want to do and don't let, don't let anyone tell you no. Um, throughout your life, you're going to come across people to say, oh, you're not good enough. Oh, it can't be done. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. Just find that support system, find those friends, and it absolutely can be done if you work hard enough. That is an incredibly positive note to end on. Thank you so much, Sam. So for anyone who wants more information on being a forensic pathologist, I recommend going to reddit.com slash r slash forensic pathology. Or if you're just interested in forensics, you can go to r slash forensics. There's a lot of interesting forensic professionals there who'd be happy to help you. Otherwise, check out thename.org. That's the National Association of Medical Examiners website, thename.org. It is geared a little bit more towards people who are already forensic pathologists, but there is a lot of education there. And there's a lot of outreach and, and ways to get in contact contact with us, including if you wanted to hire a medical examiner for a private autopsy or something like that, please feel free to reach out to me on uh, Instagram at Dr. Handberg. And that is the name of my YouTube channel as well. And while we still have it, I'm on TikTok as at Forensic MD. Sam, did you have any social medias that you want to share? Uh, yeah, I'm on Instagram. And I didn't give Sam a warning, so she doesn't have her Instagram or anything ready, but I will add it in the show description. And um, thank you so much. And we'll see you next time on Becoming a Medical Examiner. Thank you. 